with us today, whether it's online or in person live. We've come to worship our Lord on this Father's Day. He is our Heavenly Father. I don't know how many of you have had good experiences with fathers growing up or bad experiences. <clears throat> but the one thing that you can count on with God is He is always the perfect Father. Let's stand and let's sing. Come, now is the time to worship because that's what we're here for, to worship our King and our Lord. Come and join me as we pray. Father, we thank you so much for this day, this day that we honor fathers, and we have placed it on a Sunday so that we can honor you, our perfect Heavenly Father. Every good and perfect gift that we have in our lives comes from above, comes from you, and we thank you for them. Father, at this time, as we look around our world, we look around our nation, our community, it might be hard to see things to be thankful for because there is such hatred, there is such division and unrest, there is such illness and fear. Lord, we ask you to step into this. Step into this time. Take the virus away from us. Remove it from our world. Heal those that are ill. Protect all of us who are not. Lord, bring healing to those who are hurting from the injustice that has been done. Those that have suffered. 
Father, I pray that you will raise the standard of morality in our country so that people will understand that obedience to you and love to you and love from you to others eliminates all these problems. You are the creator, God of the universe. And until we bow before you, we will continue to have problems and struggles and strife. Lord, we thank you for your love, for your presence here with us today. Whether someone is watching at home later this week, or they are watching at home right now, or they are here among us, wherever they are. <clears throat> Lord, you are with us. You are in our midst. You can speak to us, teach us, grow us, lavish your love upon us. We ask you to do that right now at this time. We pray this, Father, in your name, Lord. Amen. Go ahead and be seated. Thank you so much for coming out today. It is great to see you. This is Father's Day. Uh, we are blessed to have people here with us today on Father's Day. Last month on Mother's Day, uh, we were in here with just our skeleton crew. But we honored mothers as best we could, and today we honor the fathers among us. Thank you. The job of a godly parent, a godly father, is one of the hardest and most important jobs that there is. God himself in his word <clears throat> said that the man is to be the head of the house, the spiritual leader of the household. And that is evident in some of the statistics that are borne out. One of the things that we keep hearing about in all of these protests is about the children that have grown up without parents and what a, or without fathers in particular, what a high number that is, especially among the African American community. And without that spiritual leadership, Families disintegrate and children suffer. And children are left groping for some kind of direction and leadership in their life. Many times the mothers step up and do the best that they can. And some of them do a fantastic job. Some of them are overwhelmed. Just like any parent can be overwhelmed by their responsibility. But fathers truly drive households. Some of the statistics, I've shared these before. If a child is the first person in a family to come to know Jesus, everyone else in the family will come to know Jesus as their Savior about 18% of the time. If the mother is the first person in a family to come to know Jesus as their Savior, then the rest of the family will come to know Christ about 20% of the time. If the father is the first person in a family to come to know Jesus as Savior, the rest of the family will follow and become Christians and accept Jesus as their Savior 98% of the time. That's the impact a father has on a family. And it goes the other way. I've seen families where the mother and the children are coming to church and they're very involved, but the husband is not. And then eventually the children start falling away, wanting to stay home with dad. And the wife stays home because the husband keeps saying, why are you doing this? I want you here. I'd rather you be going and doing things with me today. And so fathers, you have a heavy responsibility. It has been a responsibility assigned to you by God. Do not forfeit it, but trust in Him and follow Him and obey Him and you'll be able to do this incredibly important job. 
as I said, God is our Father, our Heavenly Father. He is perfect. <clears throat> Today we're going to be singing some songs honoring Him as our Father. If you've had a miserable experience with a father, if, he, if you had a father that was abusive to you, that you couldn't trust, that was just a horrible person, don't let that picture of your father color your picture of who your Heavenly Father is. Because He's everything that your real father, your earthly father was not. God is a good, good father. Now let's sing about our good, good father.
Thank you, Jesus, for being that good, good Father to all of us, giving us those good and perfect gifts from above. Thank you for dying for us. We praise you, Jesus. Amen. Take it. 
got your Bibles. A few pieces of important business, I guess you could call it, to cover. Number one, uh, we received our statement from the St. Pauli box for the month of May. And I want to thank you and those that are watching and others who gave the discarded clothing. Uh, we had by far a record. We had 272 bags of clothing donated during the month of May, which is by far the most we've ever had. I think the, prior to this, the most we'd ever had was somewhere in the 80s. So it was a wonderful month for donations with... We were blessed with Goodwill and Salvation Army and other places like that being closed. People were home going through their stuff and they had all their clothes bagged up. <clears throat> and we were one of the few places accepting them. So we were blessed by that. Also, I received a postcard that I want to read to you. It says, Dear Skyline Baptist Church, Greetings from Taiwan. Thank you for giving to the Lottie Moon Christmas Offering and the Cooperative Program. Through your prayers, we have seen an average of four East Asians come to faith in our Lord Jesus every hour. Thank you for your part in this kingdom work. Thankfully, Judy, a worker in East Asia. And I received a note from uh, Randy Adams this last week that 50 of our families, missionary families, serving in East Asia are being forced to leave. They are being forced to, they're going, I don't know if it is political, if it is virus related or what. He didn't go into a lot of detail on that. But they are going to Taiwan and then they are coming to the United States. And they were asking if anybody had a house that they could borrow or a car that they could borrow, some place to settle because this was unplanned. And so they're looking for some assistance. Which if you happen to be able to assist a missionary family, contact me, let me know, and I'll pass your information on to Randy. But I wanted to let you know about this. Also, as we get into our message this morning, there is in front of you in your... Uh, Pew racks, a copy of the outline for you to follow, and also with your envelopes, there are these communication cards. Please take them and fill them out the front. You'll have an opportunity to fill out the back of it later. And one other important piece of business that we got, we need to deal with this morning, and it is not something that I enjoy. In any way, shape, or form, I've had to experience it far too many times. But I would like to ask April and her family to please stand. Uh, this is going to be their last Sunday with us. They are abandoning us <coughs> in our uh, time of need. They're moving back to Oklahoma for family and for job. And... So as this is their last Sunday with us, I would like to take an opportunity and pray for them. So let's pray. Father, I pray for April, for James, and for their children. Lord, we are going to miss them immensely. You have brought them into our family. You have made them a part of us. And as they leave, a part of us goes with them. And they hold will be created, a wound in our family. Lord, we wish them well. Father, we turn them over to your hands. Ask you to bless them as they travel. Bless them as they settle. Bless them as they restart a new life there in Oklahoma where they're going. Lord, may your hand be upon them in all ways. Keep them healthy and safe. And Lord, let them know that we love them, we miss them, and that there will always be a place for them here. Lord, I thank you for what the time we have had with them in our family. And 
I just ask you, Lord, to be with them in all things and help them to remember their time here with us very fondly. Take what they've learned and build upon it. Help them to bless others in your name. We pray this in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. Thank you so much. And we are desperately going to miss you. They're pulling out, what is it, first thing Saturday morning? Yeah. Okay, so I need some volunteers Friday night to go by their house and slash all their tires and unload their trucks. <laughs> no, I'm kidding. No. No, all that would do is delay them. No, we want to wish them well. We want them to have a safe journey. But to be honest, we wish you weren't leaving at all. Thank you so much for all that you've been doing for us and with us. Turn in your Bibles to Isaiah chapter 42. Isaiah chapter 42. We have been talking a few weeks back. We were talking about being light and salt in the world. And we want to continue talking about this. We talked in general about being light and salt. And how salt in particular, salt has a preservative effect. Salt has a flavor impact, and sometimes in an open wound, salt burns. Sometimes it bites. And sometimes we as Christians have to apply that salt to the immorality of the world around us. But there is a right way to do it and a wrong way to do it. And we've talked a little about that. We're going to move on today, and we're talking about light. We've been talking about this in, if you'll pardon the expression, in light of influencing our community, having a positive impact on our community. And the best and the easiest way is be living out who we are as followers of Jesus. Being salt of the earth, light to the world through all of these protests that have been going on and all. I have been seeing several posts, several opinions, several things about how this is how and where the church has failed. Because even today, 11 to 12, quite often is the most segregated hour in America today. We're all very familiar with the fact that there are churches that are considered and called black churches because the vast majority of the people that attend are African American. One reason, going all the way back into the 17, 1800s, <clears throat> one reason for the black churches was that they were not welcome in the white churches. And unfortunately, there are some churches today where that is still true. And people like that are giving a black eye to the name of Jesus. Because they're not living out the life that Jesus commanded. They are not living out the example that Jesus gave. Jesus was all inclusive. He included the Samaritan woman. He included blessing a woman from Tyre. He was always reaching out and we're talking about, we're going to talk about this more in coming weeks. Light is more positive in what it provides than salt. Because while salt prevents decay, salt hinders decay, salt is much, light is much more positive. Because light makes it easier to live. 
Light makes it easier to walk. Light makes it easier to read. Light makes it easier to see. Salt is much more negative in some ways. Those of you with high blood pressure, you know salt is a negative for your life. You have to eliminate it or cut it way back. Light is what we are supposed to provide. The context of Matthew chapter 5, the Sermon on the Mount, makes the meaning clear when Jesus says you are the light of the world. Light provides orientation, clarity, vision, finding the way. The concept of light is prominent throughout the scriptures. Light is always in the scriptures associated with good. Genesis 1.3 God said, let there be light, and there was light. And God separated the light from the darkness. And he called the light day, and the darkness night. And the evening and the morning were the first day. And he looked upon the light, and he said it was good. Light is always associated with good. Darkness is often associated with lostness, judgment, ignorance, and foolishness. Ecclesiastes 2.14 is a good example of this. As well as John 12.35. Pop right past Ecclesiastes. John 12, 35, this is Jesus speaking. He said, the light will be with you only a little longer. Walk while you have light so that the darkness doesn't overtake you. The one who walks in darkness doesn't know where he's going. In the Ecclesiastes 2, 14 that I mentioned, the wise man has eyes in his head, but the fool walks in darkness. Darkness is always a bad thing. The language of light of the world is historically salvation-oriented. God's plan for salvation of the nations is His people called to be the light of the world. Isaiah chapter 42, verse 6. I love this verse. I love this verse. It says, I, the Lord, have called you I, the Lord, have called you for a righteous purpose, and I will hold you by your hand. In other words, he's not going to leave you alone. He's not going to let you struggle on your own. I will hold you by the hand. I will keep you and appoint you to be a covenant for the people and a light to the nations. This has always been God's plan. This has always been God's desire. This call is ultimately fulfilled by Jesus who passed the responsibility on to us to be the light of the world. Jesus was identified by Simeon as the light to the nations at his dedication in Luke chapter 2. If you remember at the end of the Christmas story when he's taken to the temple to be dedicated, Simeon sees Jesus and knows that he is to be the light to the world the light to the nations. Jesus is the light of the world. This is spelled out in John chapter 8, John chapter 12. And Jesus, in the Sermon on the Mount in Matthew 5, says, you are the light of the world. If you're a follower of Jesus, you are the light of the world. It starts with Jesus is the light of the world. John 8, 12. Jesus spoke, saying, I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will not walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. Jesus gives. Jesus is the light of the world. And Jesus gives light for life. Jesus gives light for life. One thing that we know, plants do not grow well without, without light, without sunshine. 
They need the sunshine to create their food. You go into a deep, dark cavern where there's no light, and you're not going to find very many trees growing, or bushes, or grass, because there's no light. And if we want to have life, if we want to have the abundant life that Jesus talks about, when Jesus talks about, I have come that you may have life and you may have it more abundantly, we can only have that abundant life by walking in the light of Jesus. Jesus gives us that light. And so, we can walk in his light, or we can walk in darkness. The light that he gives us is abundant life, that's John 10.10. 10. It's also eternal life. I read John 8.12. talks about eternal life coming from the light of Jesus. Jesus shines his light on everyone. Jesus shines his light on everyone. No one is outside of the light of Jesus. Jesus shines his light on everyone. Now, whether anyone or everyone chooses to acknowledge that light... That's up to them. But to show how Jesus shines his light on every person, I'm going to give you just one example. That example is the calendar. This year is the year 2020. And now because people have tried to remove God from everything, it's no longer referred to as the year 2020 A.D., after the coming of Jesus, which is what it actually meant. But our calendar, the very calendar that we live by, was split because of Jesus. Everyone can see that. Another way where his light shines on everyone is in simple morals and values. There's a lot being made today. Morals, values are being politicized. And if you stand for the, excuse me, using the politically correct term, but the traditional Judeo-Christian morals and values, you're outdated, outmoded, and wrong. No! It's God who sets the standard. God is the creator. God is the one who set everything in motion. He's the one that gets to set the rules and the standards and the values. And if you uphold those, you're just being obedient to God. And if you reject them, you're rejecting the God who created them. But the morals and values and standards that God says are right, many of them, you will find very few people who would disagree with them. Just looking at the Ten Commandments. Okay, if you're going to believe in a God... The first four that deal with your personal relationship with God, most people are going to say that's okay. Very few people want to see you take a carved something and personally bow down to it, and offer sacrifices to it and all this, when God said don't make a graven image. If you're going to believe in a God, very few people are going to say that the one true God is not the God you want to follow. As you get down into the morals, 
the values of the last six. And most people are going to say, you should. It's right to honor your father and mother. We have Mother's Day and Father's Day to honor our mothers and fathers. Now, they should be honored on every day, not just one day a year. And there are going to be some that are going to say, my mother or my father, my parents, do not deserve to be honored. Well, they deserve to be respected because they are mother or father. You don't necessarily have to respect them for what they've done. But for the position they hold in your life, they deserve to be honored. And most people, the vast majority of the people around the world, would agree with that. The vast majority of the people around the world would say you shouldn't lie. They will also say they do lie. But overall they understand it's probably not, it's really not right. Most of them believe that it's not right to lie unless you can do it without getting caught. The vast majority of people would say stealing is wrong. Even though we see it going on all the time. We've seen a lot of it on the news lately. Taking stuff that's not yours. Stealing. <clears throat> We also moralize our stealing. Well, it's only a pencil. It's only a pen. I saw a thing where like 85% of people admitted to being guilty of stealing from their work. They'll steal a stapler or they'll steal a ream of paper or they'll steal a pen or, well, that's just a couple of dollars. That's no big deal. It's not like I'm stealing a company car or something like that. So we'll rationalize our stealing. But overall, we'd say stealing is wrong. Overall, most people would say that murder is wrong. Overall, most people would say that cheating on your spouse, adultery, is wrong. And so on and so forth. And so the vast majority of people agree with these values and standards they just want to do it on their terms. Jesus' light shines on everyone. Everyone sees it. Whether they choose to admit it and choose to accept it or not, that's a different story. Jesus is the light of the world. But the neat thing, and I talked about this earlier, Jesus makes you the light of the world. Jesus makes you the light of the world. His light becomes our light. His light becomes our light. Like the moon reflects the sun, so we reflect the Son of God. Jesus makes you the light of the world. His light becomes our light, and we reflect it. We let it shine through us. We cannot create our own light but we can shine his light. Paul taught this to the followers of Jesus in Ephesians chapter 5. In Ephesians chapter 5, verse 8, Jesus talked about this very thing. For you were once darkness, but now you are light in the Lord. Walk as children of light. You were once darkness, but now you are light. He didn't say that you were light. He says you are light. We become the light in place of Jesus because Jesus is no longer physically walking the earth. He is present on the earth through us. We become the light in his place. This is what John said in John chapter 9. John chapter 9 verse 5. As long as I am in the world, I am the light of the world. This is Jesus talking. And so 
since he is no longer in the world physically, we have become the light of the world. In Matthew chapter 5, Jesus said that you are the light of the world. And when it comes to our light, one very simple fact, light is worthless when it's hidden. Light is worthless when it's hidden. We all know the song, this little light of mine. Hide it under a bushel? No. Because the light is worthless when it's hidden. Let your light shine. Matthew chapter 5, again, as Jesus is talking about you are the light of the world. In Matthew chapter 5, he tells us, starting with verse 14, as he's talking about this, you are the light of the world. A city situated on a hill cannot be hidden. Any of you ever been driving down the highway in the middle of nowhere at night? You know you're getting 10, 20 miles from a town, and you can see the glow from the light of the town ahead, and you know you're getting closer. A city cannot be hidden. The lights cannot be hidden. No one lights a lamp and puts it under a basket, but rather on a lampstand, and it gives light to all who are in the house. Let your light shine. Hiding your light risks losing your light. You take a candle, and you light it, and you put it under a cover, and it'll burn up the oxygen, and it'll go out. If you claim that you're a follower of Jesus and you are not living that way, you are not telling people about Jesus, you are not letting your light shine, then you're going to end up losing your light. I could give you example after example after example of people my son and I were talking about one earlier. A young lady we knew from youth camp. When she was there, she was on fire for God. She was claiming to be a Christian. She was involved in her church and in her youth group. She graduated from high school and has gone way out. So many of the kids that I've known, they had their light and they hid it. They wanted to fit in. So when they weren't with their church group, they changed how they talked. They changed how they lived. They changed what they believed. And their light went out. And now many of them are not living as followers of Jesus. When you hide your light, you risk losing it. I'm not talking about necessarily losing your salvation, but if you're willing to hide your light, if you are willing to risk losing your light, if you're willing to not tell people about Jesus and to live for Him, then you probably don't have a personal relationship, a saving relationship with Him to begin with. If you're willing to hide your light... Are you really a follower of Jesus? If salt emphasizes the influence of the Christian in countering evil, light emphasizes the role of Christians in advancing good. John Stott says, Good works is a general expression to cover everything a Christian says and does. Every outward manifestation of his Christian faith. If you're not doing the things of God, you're not involved in good works, and you're not letting your light shine. You're not being involved in the things of God, in good works. Good works is not what gives you a personal relationship with Jesus. Let me repeat that. Good works is not what gives you a personal relationship with Jesus. Good works do not get you into heaven. Good works are the fruit 
or the result of your relationship with Jesus that only comes through faith. If you're sitting here today, if you're watching on TV, watching online, and you're counting on your good works to get you into heaven, you will fail. Period. It's only through faith in Jesus. In trusting in the saving work that Jesus did, shedding his blood on the cross, dying, being buried, and rising again, that you can have eternal life. Good works are not the root that the relationship comes from. They are the fruit of it. And the question, are you ready? Is there a reason you don't want to accept the light of Jesus into your life? Is there a reason you don't want an abundant life, an eternal life? And a life where God takes you by the hand and leads you and walks with you as you become a light to the nations. Is there any reason you don't want Jesus to forgive you of your sins? If you'll take that communication card, you'll see on the back one of the options in this first, my next step today is to become a first-time follower of Jesus. If you're ready to become a follower of Jesus, now is your opportunity. If you're here, fill that out and mark it. If you're watching and you're ready for this, make sure you comment. Send us a personal message or a public comment and let us know the change that God is doing in your life, the wonderful work of salvation. And we want to rejoice with you. And we want to thank God for you. We want to encourage you. And so if you're ready, I want to encourage you. I'm going to say a prayer and I want you to pray it with me. Here in this room, as I pray, I'd like every head bowed and every eye closed. And I would like you to seriously consider do you need to pray this prayer are you ready to pray this prayer so let's pray just repeat after me dear Jesus I know I'm a sinner thank you for dying for me help me to live for you and let my light shine everywhere I go. Help me to grow in you and to become who you created me to be. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Now, if you are here this morning and you prayed that prayer, I would like to talk to you after the service. Make sure you come and see me. Talk to me. Make sure you've got that marked on your card and I'll follow up with you. For the rest of us, those that have already made that decision for Jesus, what are you going to do to let your light shine in the darkness? What changes do you need to make? Do you have someone you need to share Jesus with? Do you know of someone close to you that you've been hiding your light from and you need to let it shine? Are you going to make a conscious commitment to step up your effort to let your light shine when you're at the store or when you're talking to people online? or on the phone, or having video chats, or Zoom meetings, or whatever it is. This is your time to make that commitment. Let me pray for you as you make these commitments. 
Dear Father in Heaven, I thank you for these people that are going to make commitments, that they're going to say, yes, I want my light to shine everywhere I go. Lord, don't ever let me hide it again. Lord, if I start to hide my light, make me aware of it so that I will not hide it. Help me to have the influence in our community of moving it forward, advancing the good that comes from the light of Jesus. I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. As we walk with God, we will know joy.